Hi, it's The Wire, thewirecron.blog, a free blog. Uh, always, 1776.com. Let's talk about the show right now on Peacock called The Myth of the Zodiac Killer, right? The main author is Thomas Horan, right? The filmmaker also does an excellent job. I strongly recommend that people watch this series. It is very important, right? We'll talk about it. But first, remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Now, I'm in the Bay Area. I've lived in the Haight-Ashbury section of San Francisco in the past, right? Right now, I live in West San Jose. Understand, here in the Bay Area, one of the biggest criminal masterminds in the Bay Area's history has been the Zodiac Killer. Right? This Zodiac Killer is so uh, much of a criminal mastermind that you even had a copycat in New York City pretend to be the Zodiac Killer. I understand that the orthodoxy that one man committed the Zodiac killings is deeply entrenched in our culture. And I also understand there's an online community, I myself am a part of it, that has discussed the Zodiac killings in the past on different websites, right? Well, what I want people to do is to just consider how the world has changed over the years, how things that we thought we knew turned out to be false. Right? There was a time, just my own personal story, where I was firmly convinced that Lee Harvey Oswald was the lone assassin of John F. Kennedy. Right now, I'm not even convinced that Oswald was an assassin. Please review my JFK videos here online. Understand, there was a time, too, when I thought that Siren Siren was the lone assassin of RFK. Now, while I have no doubt that Siren Siren was in the room with a firearm that he was discharging, hitting several people, right? I question whether he's actually the person who killed Robert F. Kennedy, right? I have a video up on that as well. Just understand that as we go through life, ideas that sound preposterous, like this one, Thomas Horan's idea that the Zodiac Killer never existed, that some opportunists started writing letters and that the police got distracted toward this lone gunman narrative and that the police overlooked other evidence and other suspects. Understand that as preposterous as that sounds, we need to look at the evidence and we need to make decisions for ourselves. Right now, let me just say that if Haran is right, this would not be the first time, in fact, it's not close to the first time, that a letter writer falsely took credit for a string of high-profile murders. Right? Jack the Ripper, according to most historians now, did not write the Dear Boss letter that named him Jack the Ripper. Let me tell you, when I was a kid growing up in Queens, I vividly remember the summer of 1977, the Son of Sam killings. Well, the Son of Sam letters we know were written by David Berkowitz. But just understand, I'm not convinced that David Berkowitz did all of the murders. I believe if you look into that case, you're going to find out about a satanic cult. More importantly, if you look into the police drawings at the time the murders were committed, you're going to see drawings that look very different from each other. Now, here with the Zodiac, we have a problem. 
we have three letters written on July 31st, 1969, right? Months after, more than half a year after the David Faraday, Betty Jensen murders, right? Months afterwards. Then we have a letter written on August 4th. We also have handwriting on the car door at the Lake Berryessa murder that seems to match the handwriting in the Zodiac letters. But there are problems, right? By the time of the handwriting on the car door for the Lake Berryessa murders, the Zodiac letters had been published in newspapers. Now, significantly, the people who received the letters know that the letters themselves were blue and on white paper. They're written in blue ink, blue felt ink. But understand, in the 1960s, the world of newspapers were black and white. The person who wrote on the side of Brian Hartnell's Gia Carr wouldn't have known that the actual color of the Zodiac's ink up until that point had been blue. So, of course, that person who already would have knowledge of the handwriting, which was published in the paper, wrote in black ink. We have another problem, too, that the killer, the actual killer of the second set of homicides, right, the Darlene killings, would know that those actual murders took place after midnight on the night that started on July 4th. So understand, the killer would know, since the killer seems to be a perfectionist, if you follow the popular narrative, that the Darlene Ferrin killing took place early in the morning on July 5th, not July 4th, right? Understand the need for precision, because on the door, of Brian Hartnell's car is the timing, literally the date and time of the Lake Berryessa murder. But yet, whoever wrote on that door wrote the wrong date for the Darlene Farron murder. They wrote July 4th. Right, so I believe readers need to question everything. The Drawings we have, the so-called best drawings of the Zodiac Killer, where he's wearing glasses, right, are done after the Paul Stein murder. But understand, by then you're several murders in, aren't you? We don't even have that drawing of that individual until after... Faraday is killed, Betty Lou Jensen is killed, uh, the Lake Berryessa murders take place, the Darlene Farron murder takes place. We just don't have any drawing of whoever did those murders. So I believe it's a mistake to suddenly look at the drawings after the Paul Stein murder. And I'll agree, that drawing even has cop input, right? Because folks, a San Francisco police officer with his partner literally walked right by the Zodiac Killer and contributed to, right, the review of that drawing. I'll agree that that drawing probably accurately refers to Paul Stein's killer. But the real question is whether Paul Stein's killer 
was the killer of the other so-called Zodiac victims. So let's take a breather here. Let's take a step back and let's ask questions because I believe it's in the asking of questions that we realize how little we know about the actual Zodiac Killer. Understand, the drawings made after the Paul Stein murder don't match. The drawings made after Lake Berryessa. And understand, a number of people saw the Lake Berryessa Killer without the head mask on. So let's get into it. Let's go down the rabbit hole. Now, is it possible that our society is so depraved that a series of murders could be committed by an ensemble of individuals who, let's get controversial here, privately among themselves know the details of the murders and may have shared them with other psychopaths in their social circle, one of whom has chosen to write letters about the crimes. And of course, the answer is yes. You have the Manson family, and I'm just randomly naming a group that engaged in criminal activity, outcasts living together and committing terrible crimes allegedly in anticipation of a race war, right? That's the Vincent Bugliosi party line, isn't it? That's what we believe. I would question that. I'll do a Charles Manson video in the future. But just understand, we know that there are groups out there sharing information about crimes, committing crimes together, people in the know. You have mob culture where some of the members have shared time in prison for doing terrible crimes, including paid murders. And of course, that group is bonded together by a loyalty pledge, a blood pledge, right? You have gangs as well as motorcycle clubs who will have a propensity to do outrageous acts as part of their gang initiation process. Let me just tell you, you have a culture that believes that snitches need stitches. And of course, you have actual criminal enterprises who are engaged in criminal activity for financial gain. But understand, once you have a criminal enterprise that it has bonded to each other and that can expect privacy, right? It's not hard to imagine involvement in crimes without financial gain, where the members keep their ability to maintain secrets in force. Right? I'm just telling you, when I was a kid, much of Manhattan was controlled by the mob. Right? It was understood that you were at risk if you ran afoul of the mob. Back then, you didn't have all these police informants. Back then, you didn't have this whole Sammy Gravano culture where guys are going in witness protection and going against the mob, you had much more mob loyalty. Let me point out, too, that often on these cold case shows, right, that talk about real crimes that have been committed, you'll find out that a group of people knew who the actual perpetrator was 15, 20, 30 years ago. 
but they didn't talk. Perhaps out of some kind of loyalty to the perp. Maybe the perp was a fraternity brother. Maybe the perp was a family member. Right? Maybe the perp was just a really good friend. Maybe the perp was a fellow prison convict who had gotten out of prison. Right? But we all need to understand that you have groups in society that keep secrets for the most horrible crimes. Now, I don't believe that one person did all of the alleged Zodiac killings, right? Because the murders, to me, seem to be done by different personality types. Now, understand, I'm just a true crime podcaster. I'm not an FBI-trained criminal profiler. Before watching this latest show, I've always been bothered by the inclusion of the first two murders as serial killings for or done by the Zodiac Killer. I've always been bothered because to me, it just didn't seem to fit. So let's go back to the first two murders. December 20th, 1968. David Faraday and Betty Lou Jensen are shot and killed while parked at Blue Rock Springs Park in Vallejo, California. Now, let me just say he is 17, she is 16. During the shooting, she gets out of the car, which is significant, and is shot five times in the back. She dies a little bit more than 20 feet from the car. Now, let's ask some questions 17 minutes into this video. Were these teenagers targeted? If so, did the killer target the teenagers or did they target the car they were in? The car they were in was David Faraday's car. It was a light-colored 1961 Rambler station wagon. Because it was light-colored, because it's a station wagon, a relatively big car, it would stand out at night in the dark. And we're talking about 11 p.m. or so at night. Now let's ask some questions, some more questions. Did some jealous person intend to shoot one of the teenagers? This certainly looks like a brazen shooting on the side of a road that had a witness see the second car next to Faraday's and had a second person just minutes after the shootings take place see bodies, right? Understand, whoever does this crime is a daredevil. They're literally killing people who are just off the road. The possible witnesses are coming at highway speeds by them. Right, this is a brazen killing. <clears throat> now, understand that David Faraday was somewhat of a school leader. Right, he's a major boy scout. He's a school athlete. Now, in the early 1990s, former Vallejo Police Department detective John Lynch gave his theory that the couple was killed because Faraday had learned of a major drug deal and had been talking openly about who was involved. Now, just understand, that was according to Vallejo Police Department Detective John Lynch. Now, let me just say, the best part of the Haran Myth of the Zodiac Killer show was that they asked a question that really hasn't been asked enough. That question is, was there more than one shooter at the murder scene? Put differently, 
Why is there a gun shell on the passenger side of the killer's car? Is it more complicated? Was someone scorned by a similar looking station wagon owner and think that this 17 year old station wagon belonged to someone else? Did they creep up on the car and then realize that they just had some teens? And because Betty Lou Jensen jumps out of the car and is running away, did things get out of hand? Are multiple people involved? Was there a shooting where then they had to kill Faraday to remove the witness? Right, Betty Lou Jensen gets shot five times in the back. There are a lot of 22 shells by the driver's side of the killer's, where the killer's car was parked. Right, there's also a bullet on the passenger side. Was this a situation of mistaken identity where things spiraled out of control and then they had to shoot Faraday in the head just to remove him as a potential witness? Could this have ended differently if Betty Lou Jensen doesn't panic and leap out of the car? Let's get macabre. The focus has always been on a 17-year-old and a 16-year-old. How much do we know and how much don't we know? Is it possible that the killer or killers was targeting someone else in the family? You know, folks, we don't know. What we do know is that this killer or killers is brazen, right? Someone sees their car. No one sees anyone wearing a costume, right? The shots that are fired at the Faraday car are all over the place. One of the shots hits the roof of the car. Right, All of this happens just a few feet off the public road. The killer is exposed, firing a lot of shots. The scene is messy. Right, We need to ask the question, did this even go the way the killer or killers wanted it to go? Now, Given the risk taken by the killer or killers in this murder, the murders of December 20th, 1968, isn't that killer much more brazen than the peeping Tom type killer at Lake Berryessa? Right? Understand. At Lake Berryessa, you have three college-age women. They're just chilling on a blanket, soaking in some sun, and they notice a guy who doesn't have a head enclosure on. Right? They actually notice a guy looking at them from behind the trees. When they turn back around, the guy's still looking at them, but he's moved to be behind a different tree. Finally, they look behind them, and the guy is gone. The women are so spooked. Again, these are college-age women. The women are so spooked by this peeping Tom looking at them from behind the trees that they actually get up and leave. It's when they're going to their car that they look and they see the white car that belongs to Brian Hart now. Right? Who ends up getting stabbed by 
someone who looks similar wearing the Zodiac outfit. Right, so just to understand the Lake Berryessa murderer is a timid peeping Tom type. We'll talk about what happened there a little bit later in this video. But are we to believe that that timid peeping Tom type guy who has taken great pains, great pains, to create a Zodiac outfit and who isn't just driving up then shooting into the car next to them but is actually at Lake Berryessa being a peeping Tom before he decides to stab a different group of people. Are we supposed to believe that that Lake Berryessa guy is the Zodiac who killed Faraday and Betty Lou Jensen? Are we supposed to believe that that shy, timid Lake Berryessa guy, that only leaves a lot of shell casings by the side of his car. And understand, he doesn't use a gun, doesn't fire a gun. He has a gun on him, but he doesn't fire a gun at Lake Berryessa if you believe it's him. But do you believe that peeping Tom guy who's privacy-centric would also leave a stray 22 caliber shell on the passenger side of the car? Well, let's continue. Now, if the motive for the Faraday and Jensen murders was to terrorize the public Right, because it's not robbery. They don't take Faraday's school ring. Right, they don't rob Faraday and Betty Lou Jensen. If the motive for the Faraday and Jensen murders was to terrorize the public and wasn't personal against these particular victims, why would the Zodiac then wait more than seven months? before sending the first set of Zodiac letters. Right? If the first two murders are about publicity, are about introducing yourself to the world, are about challenging law enforcement, letting the Bay Area know, hey, I'm here and I'm killing people. Why would the Zodiac wait? until July 31st of 1969 to send the first batch of Zodiac letters, right? It's a set of three letters that he sends to different media outlets. And understand, if you've had seven months to think about it, why would the Zodiac not call themselves the Zodiac in that first letter? Why wait until letter number two, which he sends out on August 4th? Let's ask another question, and this one is foundational. Are these the killer or killer's first killings? I encourage people to research the murder of Sherry Jo Bates in Riverside and the handwriting. This is important, it's the handwriting that's found six months later, a similar time frame to when the Zodiac letter is sent after the Faraday murders. Right, in the Sherry Jo Bates case in Riverside, California, that's Southern California, there's handwriting on a desk found at Sherry's school at Riverside City College, which appears to match the Zodiac letter writer's handwriting. And that message would have been written before the first Bay Area Zodiac letter, right? Understand though, that that criminal is physical, right? And he hits his victim which is different than what happened at the Faraday murder scene. 
where Faraday and Betty Lou Jensen are shot. Right, Cherry Joe Bates is beaten up. Right, the killer also plans things to the point where the killer disengages her car beforehand. So when she comes back to the car, the car is not moving. Right, the car can't start. Then the killer makes his move. Let's complicate this even further. I encourage people to look at an even earlier set of murders. Again, it's a young couple, right? Robert Domingos and Linda Evans in Santa Barbara, where a 22 caliber weapon is used, the same caliber as the Faraday, Betty Lou Jensen shootings with the same type of Super X bullets, right? That's even earlier than the Cherry Joe Bates murder, right? So when you look at the brazenness of the Faraday Betty Lou Jensen killings, the location, the number of bullets shot, the way they just dispose of witnesses, you need to ask yourself, is this even the killer or killer's first killings, then you need to ask yourself, is this MO consistent with the Berryessa, Lake Berryessa murder that takes place later? Well, understand, after Faraday and Betty Lou Jensen is killed, you then get the July 5th, 1969, very early in the morning, killing of Darlene Farron, right, who is with Michael Majew, right? Understand, they are sitting in a car. Now, here's where it gets a bit interesting, right? They're sitting in a car by Lake Herman Road in Vallejo. Farron ends up getting shot and killed. Now, understand something, and it's major here. We are more than half a year past the David Faraday, Betty Jensen murders, and not a single Zodiac letter has been written. Right? The Zodiac hasn't taken credit for the murders. And yet we're already on to the second event. Right, folks, there are no Zodiac letters written in the six months after the David Faraday, Betty Jensen murders. None. So then we get to July 5th. Now, again, if the motive is to terrorize the Bay Area, where are the letters? Why is this still viewed as a one-off type of murder? Also, do we have any angle on the motive of the murder, right? Why would someone go after a 17 and a 16 year old? Is there a drug angle? Is there a mistaken identity angle? Was this supposed to be a robbery, but oh, somebody jumps out of the car, Betty Lou jumps out of the car, starts running, gets shot in the back, then it becomes a murder where everyone has to get killed, apart from the killers. We know little about the Faraday murders. Little. So now we're at July 5th, 1969. Now, understand here that Darlene Farron is in a car with Michael Magoo. If you believe Darlene Farron's sister, Michael is just a friend. But of course, they've been out the night of July 4th. You're now a few minutes past midnight. Now, before you get into July the 5th, at some time, these two who are at some lover's lane type of situation, right, some place where young people like to hang out, Notice that a car has pulled up behind them. 
right? The car hangs there for a little bit, then the car drives off. Nothing happens. Later, a car pulls back up behind them. If it is the same person as before, then it's a planned attack. Because the person may have come back with a gun, a flashlight, and a plan. But as I make this video, we don't know if the second car that pulls up was the same as the first car that pulled up and left. We don't know that. Now understand here you have a different dynamic. Darlene is the driver here. The woman is in the driver's side of the car. The guy is in the passenger side of the car. Right now, understand, the car that pulls up, the second car, if it's the first car, the same car that pulled up earlier, they would know that the woman is in the driver's seat. They would know that the guy is in the passenger side of the car. Now here, the murder is brazen, just like the first murder. Right, the driver of the car, calmly in back of Darlene's car, calmly walks to the passenger side of Darlene's vehicle. He has a bright flashlight on his gun. Darlene and Michael think it's a cop and they're actually reaching for identification. But when the killer gets to the passenger door, he opens fire hitting Darlene multiple times and hitting Michael. He thinks it's over. He starts walking away from the car. Michael stupidly groans. So the killer comes back and fires more shots. Folks, this is brazen. Whoever this killer is, is not a peeping Tom type guy who was trying to look at college age girls and who, you know, then later puts on a hood and attacks two other people. Um, that's not this guy. This is a guy who, after brazenly shooting into the car and then taking steps away from the car, has the courage to double back, go back to the car and fire more shots. Let's figure out, too, the situation. This started off as the night of July 4th. In other words, this is a party night. People are out. If I'm at a popular teenage hangout type of Lover's Lane type area, this is going to be one of those nights where folks might be out. Folks might see me. And even that doesn't stop the guy from coming back and firing more shots into the car. Now let's go into the car. Darlene, she's 22, three years older than Michael. She's been married twice. This is the 1960s. People married a little bit earlier than they do now. Her first husband claims that he decided to end their marriage because Darlene had a wandering eye and liked other men. Right? Hubby number two was not Michael in the car. Michael Magoo, right? Hubby number two is nowhere to be seen. He's actually off working someplace. So here is Darlene out with the 19-year-old. Got three years younger, but three years at that age is more than three years at later ages, right? She's out with a younger man and she has a past. Was there a target here? Let's ask tough questions. Was it Darlene? Was it Michael who's hit almost as many times as Darlene? Darlene ends up being hit five times. Michael ends up being hit four times. We don't know. But 
Is it plausible here that the killer who does not have on a costume or mask and is relying on a flashlight to hide his identity, and we know this because Michael survives the attack? Is it possible that this is the same guy who would later, knowing that Michael's alive because I'm assuming the Zodiac is all involved in his narrative and is reading the press you know, he's sending letters. He would later send letters to press outfits. He had to know, given the high profile of this story, that Michael's still alive, right? Would this killer later take time to design a costume to hide his identity for the Lake Berryessa stabbings, right? Would this killer, who's adept with a handgun. And by the way, it's a nine millimeter. It's not a 22 like the first murders, right? Like the Faraday Jensen murders. This is a guy with a nine millimeter. Would this guy suddenly decide that he's going to become a stabber? Given the efficiency with which he wielded this nine millimeter and the brazenness in killing Darlene Farron here and shooting the guy she's with four times, right? Shoots her five times. Now, the case takes a turn here for the first time. The Darlene Ferrin killer calls police and takes credit for the killing, as well as the killing of the kids the year before. Now understand, this is the first time that a potential killer, and I use the word potential because we have to make a leap of faith that the caller is the killer. This is the first time that a potential killer is linking the two events. The caller, of course, does not identify themselves as the Zodiac. Before the call, no letters are written. Now let's pivot here and let's add some tough questions. Why make the call? Is this some Riddler fantasy? If you recall the old Batman series, is this some Riddler fantasy to challenge and frustrate the police? Or is this an effort to confuse the police by trying to link this crime to a different or relevant crime? Is it possible that there's no relationship here to the earlier killing of David Faraday and Betty Lou Jensen? Is it possible here, given the precision of the shooting and the calmness with which this killer returns to the car, he knows how to use a flashlight to blind the people in the car and hide his identity while not wearing a costume? Is it possible that this killer was a hired professional killer and that the person who hired the killer to cut down Farron or Magoo knew someone with inside information about the earlier Faraday and Jensen killings? Right? Let's also keep in mind that this killing takes place shortly after midnight on the night that starts on July 4th, right? This killing technically takes place on July 5th. If the car that originally pulled up behind Farron and Magoo was the killer's car, and if the killer returned to kill them, then the killer would have been spending the night of his July 4th holiday following this couple as fireworks and celebration happened around him. In other words, this killer would be either a loner or a professional or some aggrieved lover, right? The killer, chances are here, would have no life. His holiday would be filled with either seeking revenge or innocent victims. Right now, understand, 
Magoo or Maju, I don't know how to pronounce his name, we'll go with Magoo, gets a good look at the guy. According to Magoo, he is white, 5'8 to 5'9, late 20s. More than 20 years later, Magoo would identify the guy as Arthur Leigh Allen. Then the letters start. The first letter is dated July 31st, 1969. If the shootings were planned, why did it take the Zodiac writer 26 days after the second set of shootings to send his first letter? And if the Zodiac killer planned on calling himself the Zodiac, why was the word Zodiac not the answer to the cipher? contained in the July 31st, 1969 letter. Why does the Zodiac letter writer not call himself Zodiac in that July 31st, 1969 letter? If the killer knew that he had been seen by Michael Magoo and was paranoid about being recognized, wouldn't he have tried to kill Magoo at a later time? Right? Magoo doesn't quite know who the guy is. Right? If you believe the Lake Berryessa guy who's created a costume and all this other stuff is paranoid about being spotted, well, here he's left a survivor. Why hasn't he followed up with that survivor? If that survivor was dangerous enough, where, as he's leaving the scene, The killer hears the survivor moan. The killer felt it necessary to double back and to fire more shots into the car. Why is it that the killer then doesn't completely hunt down Magoo? Especially if the killer knew he was going to try to publicize the killings. Now understand, the second letter written by the Zodiac He writes three letters on July 31st, right, to three different media outlets containing different parts of his puzzle, right? He writes a fourth letter. I'm calling it the second letter because it's the second batch. He writes the fourth letter dated August 4th, 1969, just four days after the killing of Darlene Farron. Now, this is the first time, right, and it's letter number four, that the letter writer refers to himself as the Zodiac. We've had two shootings, a phone call, and one letter before the Zodiac in the second letter. If you believe there's one person responsible for all the mayhem that comes before this, calls himself the Zodiac. Now the next attack is important. We'll pick up the next attack in the next video. Thanks for stopping by. Let me know your thoughts in the comment section on anything I've said. Thanks for stopping by. See you in part two.